life tonight. <laughs> Christmas is like 26 days away or something like that. It's weird. Okay. Whew. This first one, uh, Jesse mentioned it here a few weeks back. So I just decided we would do it tonight. It's kind of a fun song, but it's got a lot of truth to it, too. Hey, Amen. It's a Rex Cringe Style original, too. <laughs> When people rub you wrong, I know you've got a song About the way that person treated you, it goes on and on and on You can jump and shout and cuss them out, but what good would it do? Jesus says to love them as much as you love you You've got to let go and let God take care of everything. He's the one that can take them, only He can make them change. He shows which way is wrong or right, and then lets us go our way. The gate is narrow and the path is straight, are you headed to heaven today? When someone's telling a tale on you, get happy, happy, happy today. You can spit and fuss and kick the dust, but they're giving someone a break. The devil comes to kill and destroy and to steal your heart away. Jesus says we can overcome, use his word today. Got to let go and let God take care of everything. He's the one that can take them, only He can make them change. He shows which way is wrong or right and lets us go our way. The gate is narrow and the path is straight. Are you headed to heaven today? Speak words of life with the tongue. You fight the devil with the Holy One Jesus is the way, truth, and light Give your battle to God, he'll take the fight You've got to let go and let God take care of everything He's the one that can take them, only he can make them change he shows which way is wrong or right, then lets us go our way. The gate is narrow and the path is straight, are you headed to heaven today? Yes, the gate is narrow and the path is straight, are you headed to heaven today? Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is just let it go. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I realize I've been left out by my friends and family I can hear the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm You remain in control in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. 
When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith. I see the future I pictured slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are rolling down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm. The eye of the storm. When they let me go and I just don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. I did my best, now I'm scared to death, we might lose everything. And when a sickness takes my child away, there's nothing I can do. My only hope is to trust you. Yeah, I trust you, Lord, in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Love. 
You rescued me so I could stand and say, I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand. I am a child of God. Let's sing that again. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. No fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Child of God. I am a child of God. Father, we thank you that, Lord, as we are your child, Lord, we no longer have to walk in fear. Because, Lord, your word says, who can be against us if you are for us? So, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name that, Father, as we talk about authority tonight, that, Lord, that you have given us authority to walk in power, that, Lord, we should walk in a place of victory, not a place of victimhood. That, Father, as we stand before you, Lord, we have absolutely nothing to be ashamed for because your word says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. So, Lord, because of that, we get a chance to walk with you, talk with you, and spend time with with you and Lord did you spend time with us so Lord we thank you and we praise you and we glorify you for that and Lord we ask that Father that you'd come make your spirit made known here tonight so Lord we love you and we praise you in Jesus name and all God's people said amen amen, amen. why don't you give the Lord a hand clap tonight amen <laughs> so let me ask you a question if the Lord were to walk in the doorway would y'all be satisfied with giving him that hand clap or would you give him a better hand clap amen <laughs> thank you Thank you, sir. All right. Kids, y'all have a good night out there tonight. Hey, buddy. Do you do me a favor? Would you put that back there on the back table for me? Thank you, sir. You are a mighty man of God. I appreciate your ministry, sir. All right, so how many of you know that sometimes we got to get back to the basics and we got to go back to the very beginning to understand who we are in Christ Jesus, amen? Brenda, would you pray for me so I can get started? Welcome back to Texas from Utah. Glad to have you back. Would you mind praying, please? Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. So next week, I would encourage y'all to please be here. Uh, Pastor George will be ministering next Wednesday night up here. I'm going to be getting ready to go to a conference uh, that I've got to go to, so he's uh, filling in for me. Uh, so y'all be here for this uh, next week. I have a feeling that, George, you know what you're ministering about yet? Whatever it'll be, it'll be good. Amen. Amen. All right, so we talked about going back to the basics. If y'all would, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1, uh, we're going to start in verses 24 through 29. Uh, we're going to be talking about authority today and who we are. Uh, one of the things that I've been praying about here recently is I've been praying that the Lord would teach me who I am in Christ Jesus. And we talk about how Jesus is a lion, amen? 
He is the Lion of Judah, and we talk about that roar of a lion. How many of you ever been to the zoo and ever heard a lion roar? Uh, some of you say, well, I've got the Lion King on videotape at home. That's not the same thing. Uh, our, one of our missionaries, Dirk Woods, has, you know, he's in South Africa, and he's talking about there's a place that you can go to. And how many people here like to camp? Raise your hands if you like to camp. They have a place over there that's out in the, the, the wilds over there, and it's a fenced-in, squared off from all the sides, even underground, even up on top. So nothing can get to you, but you can go camp in this thing, and you are the one that's in the cage. The lions like to go around the outside of the cage and look at you, and they roar, and they growl, and they grunt. And they try to dig at the wire to try to get into you. And I, my first thought was, dude, that is so cool. I'd love to go see that. I want to do that, and also wanted to go dive with the great whites until Kay started talking about raising my life insurance policy. That scared me, amen? So that is off my bucket list now because I want to make sure that she don't pack a banana peel somewhere in my backpack, amen? So when we look at authority, how many of you know that when a lion, or when a lion roars, he has authority? And you dang well better listen to him, Amen. But do you understand that Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price so that you could have that same roar, that same voice of authority? If he is called the Lion of Judah, guess what? He died to give you authority. So guess what? You have the authority to speak to the problems that you have in your life. Some of you have problems, and especially coming up in December, wondering how you're going to afford Christmas. Guys, quit wondering about how you're going to afford Christmas, amen? Because to be honest with you, you can go spend $2,000 per child for Christmas, and I promise you in two weeks, everything that you spend on those kids, they're going to look at you like, oh, what's next? Uh, what's, I done forgot about that. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but some of the best Christmases I've ever had was when I got a, one knife for Christmas, when you got a chance to sit together with your family and have a meal or have a small Christmas. Because to be honest with you, Christmas is not about a commercial thing. It's about a heavenly thing. And so when we start thinking about how much money we need to spend on our credit card, let me tell you something. I'm going to challenge you. Don't you dare put one single dollar on your credit card. Because you're going to put yourself in the devil's debt. How many of you know that 29% interest on those credit cards? That ain't a good thing. Use the authority and start speaking to the things that are not like they are, like I preached about this last weekend. Sometimes you say, Pastor, I ain't got much money. Quit worrying about what you ain't got and start thinking about what you do have. What do you have? You have the presence of the Holy Spirit up inside of you. The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. And if the Holy Spirit dwells within you, then guess what? Let the Holy Spirit speak through you for what you need. Some of you say, well, Pastor, that's just, I don't understand that. It don't take much to understand. If you ain't got nothing, don't try to go find it. Ask God in prayer and supplications so that he may fulfill your needs. As I mentioned this last week, we heard somebody say, we're talking about your needs and your wants, and he said that um, God gives you everything that you need, so if you have something that you don't, there's something you don't have, apparently you don't need it. And that'll put some things in priority. But your authority is what we need to look at. Do you know that all the way back to Genesis, God gave us authority over everything here? How many of you have ever had a horse that was a little unruly? Anybody? Anybody ever had a dog that didn't do what you said to do? I told my son the other day, my son is trying to figure out how to train a dog. And it's his first real dog from puppy. And he's having to learn this thing. And I was telling Jonathan about this dog because you can call that dog and it goes and does whatever it wants to do, right? And I told Jonathan, I said, Jonathan, if you ever want to find out how much authority you have, or how important you are, try to tell another man's dog what to do. Another friend of mine once said, what you have no authority over, you should have no opinion of. So with that being said, how much authority do you have 
in your life. And if you have authority in something in your life, then you need to have an opinion about it. And that opinion ought to be what God said about you and who you are. Amen. So let's look in Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. All right, so here's where God is making everything. How many of you know that there's nothing here by accident? God made everything. He had a plan and he had a purpose for you. And verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over all the livestock, over all of the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female. Did you notice that there's not a hundred different sex classifications there? How many is there? Two. Male and female. If you're confused about it, we'll work with you on that. We'll try to help you. But there's two according to God's word. And I want you to be able to understand that when God created you, uh, some of us have got some issues in life and we've got problems. Guys, listen to me. God is willing to work with you and help you in your worst confusion. How many of you have ever woke up really confused about your situation in life and ever sought God out and he spoke to you and gave you clear direction? I'm praying that God starts speaking into this world. And it says that so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of this whole earth and every tree that has, its, or has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Guys, listen to me. God gave you authority to rule over all the things of the earth. He gave you authority over the birds over the fish, over the livestock, all the animals that creep and crawl and fly on the ground, in the air, everything. You have authority. All right, so what I ask you this, and I'm going to give you this question, why, if God gave us authority over every single thing, why are we struggling operating in the authority that we have as the people of God? As parents, we're struggling about using our authority with our children. Oh, come on, that was a perfect opportunity. Listen to me, I'm not telling you to go home and beat your children. That ain't what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to use your authority. Quit, teach, or quit asking the school districts to raise your children. Quit asking your school districts to teach them about sexuality. Start teaching them godly principles at home about what life is truly about. When you start teaching and operating in the authority of God, you will have less problems in life. But the problem is, is it's uncomfortable to talk about sex with our children. Anybody have that problem? At our house, I like to speak about it in front of my son just to make him uncomfortable. There's some times I tell them, boy, you better go to bed early tonight, son. <laughs> Why do I do that? I do it on purpose. No, I'm not a pervert. <laughs> but the reason that I do that is because I want him to know that you don't have to be embarrassed about being a sexual person in marriage. Oh, come on. Because when you are married and you have that relationship where you can trust that person and you can share your whole self with that person, let me tell you something, operating in authority is so easy when you're able to expose everything about yourself to your whole family. You see, we don't talk about our children about sex, we don't talk to them about finances, and we don't talk to them about moral issues, we let Hollywood do that. 
Hollywood is teaching your children that they need those $200 pair of Air Nikes. I ain't going to lie to you. If there's going to be a $200 pair of shoes in our house, it better have a heel on it, and it better have a place to put spurs on it. And it better have a lot of leather. <laughs> Come on. And I just sit there and I wonder, why do we allow our society to teach our children what is the priority? We're teaching them to forego authority. Because when we don't operate in authority, guess what? They won't operate in authority. How many of you remember back when you were young? Now, Rayford may have to scratch his head for a while. But how many of you remember the things used to be different back in the day? Generations or the ages or the people and how we acted was different back then. We were more capable of certain things than they are today. And the reason that is, is to be perfectly honest with you, is because of our generation is no longer making our children suffer. Guys, let me tell you something. It ain't going to hurt your children to skip having a toy at Walmart. It's not going to skip your children, or it's not going to hurt them not to have those Air Nike or those Air Jordan tennis shoes. To be honest with you, when I was growing up, pay less was what I could afford. Hand-me-downs, or should I say love-me-downs? How many of you know that's some things that we really need in life? And you learn to get thankful when somebody gives you uh, clothes that has been gently used. And let me tell you something. I really find that in life today, we need to know what it's like to suffer because without suffering, we don't have gratitude. And if we don't have gratitude, we don't understand the need for authority. And when you walk in authority and you walk in power and you walk within strength, then all of a sudden you may not have an awful lot. But guess what? God can turn around and multiply loaves of bread and fish to feed the multitudes. What can he do with a person that understands authority and understands the love and the power of the Holy Spirit in their life? Do you know that just the people that are in this room right now is enough to be able to change Nacogdoches, Texas. You could change Nacogdoches, Texas, where the reputation would be that it'd be almost next to impossible to go to hell from Nacogdoches, Texas. But it takes you walking in authority. But a lot of Christians say, well, I don't want to offend somebody. I don't rightly care about offending somebody. That ain't my problem. But do you understand that if you allow somebody to go to hell, that is a problem. You need to love people just as they are. Because God loves you just as you are. Amen? We don't need to be judgmental with anybody. Guess what? That ain't our job. God can take care of all of that himself. But what he calls us to do is to be servants. Amen? To speak to people, to share the love, to share the encouragement. Guess what? There's sometimes being a Christian just ain't that easy. Amen? But here's the great thing is with the Spirit of God upon your life, you've got authority. Use it. Now, I want you to also listen to this in that scripture in Genesis. It said that he made God, or God made man and woman in their image. Listen to me. I'm going to say something that's really going to freak a lot of people out. God gave authority to men and women. Oh, you, you didn't hear me. God gave authority to men and women. Not just to men. The woman wasn't made out of her tailbone. She wasn't made out of her hip. Backside, she was out of our rib to be alongside of. Guys, listen to me. In parenting and in marriage, you operate in authority. Women, do not give up your authority to your husband to discipline your children because your children will lose respect for you. You need to operate in authority. At our house, we have dogs. How many of you have got dogs? They ain't going to always do what you want to do, right? How many of you know they're full of surprises? But yet, you need to operate in your children, your animals, your dogs, all these things, you need to operate in authority. 
And the more that you operate in authority, it's funny how much more they love you. Oh, are you hearing this? Because when you operate in authority with your children, listen to me, that does not mean that you're abusive. That means that you show them the standards. You show them what's important. You teach them the ground rules. Guys, it ain't going to hurt your children to be taught from a young age to call somebody Mr. or call somebody Mrs. To say sir or to say ma'am. Let me tell you something. We need to have more children that understand authority. Because, to see, if they understand your authority, then they'll respect other people's authority. Mr. Travis and Miss Cindy was really gracious to us for many years while we were there at their house when we first started this church. We had a lot of kids that used to go love to go running around. And they had a front porch over there off to the side. And it was nothing unusual to see those kids go running up on stay or up on the, or the little area of the porch over there and try to sit in their chairs or take advantage. But that was their home. That was their private space. And boy, you'd hear Rayford, um, or not Rayford, be there, <laughs> Travis, uh, turn around and say, hey, kids, get out of there. You'd see those kids go running. And I kind of laughed because how many of you know that children know what is right or wrong? Amen? But they're going to try to press you. They're going to see what they can get away with. Guys, don't let your kids get away with something on Monday, but be forceful on Tuesday and then back again on Wednesday being lax. You need to be consistent with your kids. You need to be consistent in your marriage. You need to be consistent in your jobs with your authority. There needs to be a balance with authority. Let me tell you something. My wife is the queen of my castle. By golly, since we've been married, she's been the queen of two double wide house trailers. Two, not just one. Two, by golly. Sammy Kershaw, eat your heart out. But we always had a plan and we always worked together when it came to finances to try to figure out how we were going to work our life. We always worked together. We both brought paychecks home. We both saved. We both paid bills. We tried to figure out how to scrape and save. There'd be times that Kay would look at me and say, how much money have we got this week to buy groceries? And I'd turn around and say, hey, we need this week. We need to be really careful. Uh, next week, man, we don't have to have hot dogs and top ramen. Matt Gully, we might be able to afford some fish sticks. But we worked together. And matter of fact, the other night I was showing her our finances at the church or at the house for things that we're doing and where we're at financially. Let me tell you something. When you sit there and start understanding there needs to be this balance, it's in the authority game, there is no one that is more special than the other one. You both have value and you're supposed to be side by side. If you are a single parent, listen to me. God's grace, I pray on your life. Because here's the great thing. You may not have a spouse to be there with you, but God gave you the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit will be better to you than any spouse ever will be. Oh, come on. Quit thinking that if you found a spouse, your life would be made perfect. Because let me tell you something. You find a spouse, you just found a headache. You just found a heartache. <laughs> when you start getting in a relationship with somebody, it's not going to be a perfect thing. But when you are in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit works with you and helps you and takes care of you. If God says that we're supposed to take care of the widows and the orphans, how many of you know that he, he's serious about taking care of everyone? God can take care of you in whatever need that you have. Pray for balance. If you would, turn over to Luke chapter 7, please. Luke chapter 7. I got 15 minutes, so we better get rolling. Luke chapter 7, verses 2 through 10, if you're a note taker. We're going to talk about the centurion. 
This is one of the most fascinating men to me because I'm an ex-military person. I understand this mindset. If you're in the military, you understand about chain of command. You understand about authority and how it rolls downhill. And yet, here's this man talking to Jesus. He's got a problem. He's got a servant at home that's in deep trouble. How many of you have got a family member or somebody that you care about that's in deep trouble that needs help? Anybody or am I the only one? All right, so if you've got somebody at home that's in deep trouble, family member, friend, co-worker, somebody that works for you or with you, this is the attitude that you need to have. And it says in verses 2, it says, there, there was a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders uh, of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him, and he was not far from the house when the centurion sent, or sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Then Jesus heard there, or when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and said, and turning to the crowd, followed him and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in all of Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. All right, there's a lot of things to unpack from that scripture. First of all, here is a centurion, which was a Roman citizen that loved Israel. How many of you know it's very unusual to see somebody from a foreign land that is an oppressor coming in and falling in love with the people of God? But apparently God was really working on him and brought him to a place where he loved the people and even the Jews or the Jew elders turned around and said, this man deserves for you to do this. He loves us and he even built our synagogue. He built our church. Guys, that, that shows a great devotion of love in a man's heart. And then he said, I didn't even bother to come to you because I am not worthy to even come to you, to even talk to you. How many of you know we need to get a little bit more of that in our head about how we speak to Jesus. Guys, listen to me. Jesus is not the man upstairs. Jesus ain't your co-pilot. He ain't your best friend in the fact that he wants to go to the hangout in the park with you, although he will. He is your Lord and your master. And you are his servant, but when you serve him, he calls you friend. It's this paradox. It's really cool. Because how many of you know, if you really love working for somebody, you'll have a great relationship with them. You'll serve them. And let me tell you something, the person that you work for will be thankful for who you are and do anything and everything they can to keep you in their company, to keep you in their life. Why? Because you serve. Guys, listen to me. This is not an un unreasonable thought to realize that this authority starts with understanding who Jesus is. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then there's no authority that he can give you that will be adequate. But when you raise him up on this pedestal, and you raise him up and you realize who he is, it gives you worth because when Jesus said, I give you my authority, then you got something to operate with. But Jesus is not your equal. He is greater than you. Man, I need to preach this one on Sunday. I remember when I first got to boot camp in the Army. Any ex-military people in here? Raise your hand. How many of you remember the day that you got off the bus and drill sergeants were there to meet you? Boy, that was not a pretty sight. Boy, you got off that bus, and boy, the moment you hit the ground, they are up in your face, and their hats are just hitting you upside the head. And let me tell you something. It's amazing how a felt hat can act like a hard hat. When they poked you in the forehead with those hats, it hurt. 
and they were yelling at you and screaming at you, and you recognized authority immediately, and you knew that you were not their equal. But what was interesting, by the end of boot camp, they broke you down in such a way where you were no longer the person that you was, and they rebuilt you. And by the time that you graduated boot camp, you were on name basis with your drill sergeants, and they were proud of you. And they spoke affirmations over you. And they were so proud to watch you. Guys, do you understand that when we esteem somebody with authority in that way and we serve them and we listen to them and we learn from them, then they grow to love us and respect us. Do you understand that? Authority, if you understand who gives authority, you need to understand that before you can wield authority. You can't wield what you don't recognize. Bless you. That's what you get for living in Pennsylvania. If y'all would, turn over to Matthew chapter 28, please. I got 10 minutes. Say amen when you get there. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had to say, I've, you've doubted in your faith sometimes? You've doubted in the authority of God in your life sometimes? Here's, let me give you a little word of encouragement. Here you've got men that have been walking with Jesus for that period of time, and they even doubted. It's just natural that we're going to doubt from time to time. But it says that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, the work that Jesus did on the cross gave us back the authority in our lives. Jesus went to the cross not to take back his authority, but do you understand that Jesus came to the cross to take back your authority to give it to you? Jesus ain't never lost anything. See, when Satan met Adam and Eve in the garden, he tricked them out of their authority and he took their authority, but Jesus came back to take it to give it back to you. Jesus wants you to know that when you operate in the authority that he gives you, remember one thing. Don't get abusive. Don't get a big head. Don't start riding a, a big horse. That authority that you wield, listen to me, belongs to him. And you are accountable to him when you wield that authority. When you see somebody struggling and hurting and you don't help them, guess what? It, that's on you. When you see somebody that needs a word of encouragement and all you want to do is just walk away and leave them, guess what? That's on you. God has given you the authority to speak positively in somebody's life. Guess what? You need to do that. Jesus said, all authority in heaven. Come on, do you get this? All authority in heaven and on. I have given to who? So do you notice he didn't say, I just gave you the authority that was just on earth? What did he say? All authority on heaven and earth. Guys, we don't have to wait to the throne room to worship God. We don't have to wait till we get to Revelation to be able to see this multitude of people worshiping God and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. We have that authority to do that now. We can worship God in spirit and in... Man, I love y'all. Y'all are so on it tonight. Because here's the thing about it. If you realize that you are not a victim, you are a victor. 
and you realize who you are and what you are and what you wield and what you carry, all of a sudden, you don't have to worry about a, being a victim. So many people walk in the church doors and they're like, oh, poor pitiful me, I'm broken, I'm hurt, the enemy is attacking, they're just tearing up my family. When are you going to start fighting back with the authority that God gave you? Start using the authority that God gave you and start tearing the enemy up with it. Oh, come on. Do you understand what authority is? Let me tell you something. I had a dog named Biscuit that Rex gave me one time. Biscuit was a Border Collie, and he was my buddy. Okay, One day, Kay's little unauthoritative dog decided to run away. I'm on the way to church to come preach. I'm trying to chase this dog down through a cow pasture. And I go past my round pen, and all of a sudden, here is this 2,000-pound Charlet bull looking at me, snorting, and he is pawing at the ground, and he is getting ready to charge me. I didn't see him behind the round pen until I came past it, and I froze, and I stopped, and I, I ain't going to lie to you, I think I either prayed in tongues or cussed. I don't know. I saw my life flash before me. But I saw this 55-pound border collie come fly by me, grabbed a hold of that bull by the nose and went to town, tore that bull up. Then he got through with the nose and he ran back there and he grabbed a hold of the tail and started swinging around on the tail of that bull and he chased that 2,000 pound bull away from me. And I remember sitting there humbled that a 55 pound dog had more authority in it than that 2,000 pound bull. How many of you know that 2,000 pound bull in the muscle had all the authority he needed? But you see, remember how many of you have ever heard the old saying, it's not the size of the, the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Let me ask you a question. How much fight have you got in you? How much of authority do you have in you to tackle the enemy when they come after you? Are you willing to reach up there and bite it on the nose and swing around by the tail? Are you willing to chase the enemy away from your family that needs protection? Are you willing to get tenacious for Jesus? Because guys, let me tell you, we're living in a time where we don't need this polite stuff anymore. We need people that wield the authority of Jesus Christ with love and compassion. Amen? I ain't telling you to get rude with anybody. I'm just telling you don't back up when the enemy shows up at your house. Don't back up when Jesus starts knocking, or when the enemy starts knocking at the door for your children. Some of you need to go into your war room and some of you need to get in your prayer closet and you need to start going to war for your children. Some of you need to start going to war for your marriages. Some of you need to start going to war for your jobs. Some of you need to start going to war for your church. Is it okay if I take about five minutes more? I'm going to anyhow. Acts chapter 19 and I'll close with this. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. You're only just really a couple of chapters away from where you were, or a couple of books away. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Remember, we're talking about authority, and authority only comes from what you know. It says, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Do you get that part? It says, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Guys, it's very important that you have this authority from Jesus because you have the relationship with him. You cannot have the authority of God unless you have the covenant of God. 
unless you have that relationship with him, knowing about him ain't good enough. Guys, it ought to scare you whenever they're out there trying to cast out evil demons and they're sitting there saying, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Guess what? When you see Brenda preaching up here, myself, George, Rex, anybody, Rayford, guess what? You cannot operate in our authority. You have to operate in your authority. And quit running to church waiting for our authority to help you. You have authority. You're the king and queen of your castle. Amen? As a matter of fact, if you get in trouble, you better start praying then. Don't get on the telephone until after you've got the victory. Then when you get on the telephone, use it as a testimony. But so many people walk through a problem, and the first thing they do is they get on the telephone and call everybody else up. Let me tell you something. You come after my wife or my child, son, that's mine. That's what God gave me. I'm not going to be calling up everybody. I'm going to be fighting tooth and nail. Why? Because ain't nobody. Remember what I said earlier, what you have authority, what you do not have authority over, you should have no opinion of. So what I have authority over, not only better I have an opinion, but I have a mandate from God to be a protector, a provider, a guardian, and a teacher, and yes, sometimes even a healer. Amen. Authority only comes from faith in relationship. If you have no faith, if you have no relationship, then you have no authority. It's that simple. I dare you to try to go up to the Dodge dealership or the Ford dealership. And I dare you to go walk up there to the sales manager and tell, you, or tell them to give you the keys to that brand new car so you can drive it away without paying for it. What's going to happen? They're going to laugh at you, and then they're going to call the police. But you see, you've got to pay a price for everything that you own. That price is a relationship with Christ Jesus that you have to put yourself on the cross, and you have to crucify yourself daily to operate in that authority. If you don't crucify yourself that day, then you don't have authority that day. Why do you think that it says that we're supposed to wear the whole armor of God every day? You have to crucify yourself every day in the presence of God. Does that make sense? The authority that I have in Jesus, I have not because I know about him. But the authority that I have in Jesus is because I know him. And better yet, he knows me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? If you get that scripture in your heart and you get it engraved in you, then you won't be a victim. What did Paul say? We are more than conquerors. And if you're going to be more than a conqueror, it means you've got to be a ruler and you've got to be somebody that governs, that provides, that protects. But you see, so many people fight a fight. They win something, but then they ignore it. See, when you win a fight, when you've beaten the devil back, when you've won your children, when you've won your spouse, when you've won in your family, guess what? Now it comes time to rule over that and to operate in authority. That doesn't mean that you are a, an abusive person. That means that you rule in authority and grace and love. Amen? Did anybody get anything out of this tonight? I sure had a lot of fun preaching. So guys, I'm going to give you this option. If you need to come up and talk to me about anything, if you need prayer, y'all come up here and come see me. If you don't, listen to me. Go home and operate in the authority that God gave you. But make sure that you wield it in grace and kindness. Amen? Now the fruits of the Spirit to lead you when it comes to operating in authority. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus.
Father, I thank you for this congregation tonight. Lord, as we've had some fun here tonight, Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would move upon us. Father, encourage us. Father, strengthen us and teach us how we wield authority in the name of Jesus Christ and only in his name only. Allow us to teach our children, our spouses, our communities, our co-workers, our family members, that, Lord, we can operate in the authority, but we also do it with the fruits of the Spirit. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you, and, Lord, I ask that you would bless these people tonight. Lord, bless them. Make them the head and not the tail, the top and not the bottom. Lord, bless them in their comings and their goings. Lord, bless them in the highways and the byways. Lord, bless them in the rural areas. Bless them in the cities. Father, I ask that you would bless their homes, their families, their herds, their crops, their health, their finances, their jobs. And, Lord, I thank you that, Lord, their barns are full. Lord, they don't need bigger barns. They just need more neighbors. So, Father, we praise you and glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said? Guys, if y'all need us, come on up and see us. If you don't, y'all have a good night. Love you.